You can sell, literally sell a deal for 10% plus or more to close it in as little as seven to 14 days and get more money than you ever planned on it. And you never even have to leave your desk and there's no contingencies on it. Welcome mm. to the Wholesalers and Investors JV Networking Hub's monthly mastermind. We've got uh, two of my favorite people in the industry that uh, I follow and, and watch and um, have, have sort of known for a fair while now. It is um, none other than Rick and Zach Ginn. And anyone that doesn't know them, um, Flip with Rick's got, I think, uh, a thousand videos, um, content videos, wholesaling videos, everything, real estate videos, creative finance videos on YouTube. That's that's a YouTube channel. And Wholesaling Houses for Real, I think it's got about, it's nearly up to about 60, 65, 66,000 members now. So that's kicking goals. Uh, but the main highlights is Zach and Rick do free coaching within the, within the platform. So anyway, I won't go on. I'll introduce them and I'll let them, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll let you guys just do a brief backstory each of just sort of how, how you started and, um, you know, how you got to this conglomerate that is flipped with Rick and wholesaling houses for real. So I'll let you guys take over. Yeah. So, um, I'm Zach in, this is Rick in dad's son. And, uh, we run a seven figure wholesaling mm. operation out of Port St. Lucie, Florida. And we have one of the, we have one of the largest virtual wholesalers out here too. And, mm. uh, basically what we do is we just teach real estate wholesaling for free. Uh, we make a lot of our money off of just helping people. Um, more or less, we don't have to sell coaching because when we teach you wholesaling, a lot of you guys send us deals and we split the deals with you. And that's how we make a lot of the money through the content and stuff we do. Um, so basically that's what we do. Uh, we have four YouTube channels. All combined, roughly over 60, 65,000 subscribers off of that. And uh, what we do is we teach real estate for free. We have the largest real estate wholesaling course. And uh, we're not here to take your money. We're here to just teach you for free. And that's what we do. That's it. So uh, pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm dad. So uh, I started back in uh, early 2003 and uh, did the traditional route. <laughs> Went to college, got a good job, worked my the corporate ladder, and just, um, I I just decided it wasn't for me. I couldn't take it anymore. So uh, I reached out. I took a couple courses on just how to buy real estate, how to do buy and hold, and I used that up quickly. And then I decided to figure out how to do wholesaling with very little information out there. Long story short, here I am, twenty years. Uh, it's been very profitable. Um, I've made every mistake in the book. I've started from everyone's journey in their first buy, and I was always scared I was gonna run out of deals. So here I am 20 years later. You don't run out of deals if you learn how to do wholesaling right. Um, I got tired of pe people teaching wholesaling like it was back in 2003, and today that we can do this incredible software where we can communicate back and forth. Me and Zach are just trying to give the information out for free, so when I took the time to train Zach, I. I learned the fundamentals of how to teach people wholesaling. And if I can teach a 16, 17 year old to make hundred K while in school, anybody can do this. So we went on this mission to just change the industry and make it take down the veil and teach you how to get wholesaling up and going. And that's what we share to the masses because I want everyone to have the same success. I can teach anyone to get to the first hundred thousand dollars in wholesaling. It's like learning your ABCs. Yeah, that's, that's true. And, like I said, anyone that watches the channel just knows that you, it, just about every, every live, you, you say that. You say it's not complex. Uh, you keep it simple. You don't yeah. need all the bells and whistles. And you can do that. And I think one of the students did their first uh, deal on, on the live that you did yesterday. And they yeah. hadn't spent a cent. They did, they'd used your free course. They'd used pulled government lists and, and all that sort of stuff. And... That's what you keep saying, Rick, is you don't need all that stuff. You, it's all here. We've given it all here. We've given you 20 years of experience. We've given you, um, you know, the combination between your experience and, and Zach's get up and go and drive, and it's all here. And, I mean, there's even a free you, – you've got a free direct mail course as well that's there that's that's linked to the wholesaling course. So that that's, you know, you probably yell it out off the rooftops, and a lot of people just go, that's too easy. I need to – 
I need to do something else. But you you always say you've got to keep it simple, don't you? You don't need to get it make it complex. Uh, super simple. The, the the simpler you make it, um, we just teach you how to market, how to talk to sellers, and the the key with it is you have to learn as you go. Wholesaling doesn't work like traditional schooling. It can't be taught straight from a textbook. It doesn't work. So the idea is we we give you simple ways to connect with sellers, and then we build your confidence as you go along. And then before long, we have a lot of people in six months just completely, I'm not going to say master the business, but doing very, very well. And we have thousands and thousands of organic testimonials. We don't ask anyone for a testimonial, but like every live I do, hey, I just did my first deal. I just made $29,000. I used exactly what you did. And wholesaling is not about being the smartest person. It's about the person who takes the right plan of action and does massive action with it. Those are the ones that do really well. And I tell people, if I can do it, Zach can do it, Graham can do it. Like you are no different than us, but you do have to take the journey. If you pay someone or you do it for free, you're never going to skip the journey. It's like being a father and raising kids from like day one to get them to this. Everybody goes along the journey and that's, there's no skipping that. And I tell people, you have to take the journey. You gotta learn. You gotta put people on a contract. You gotta take a little bit of risk and it's simple. And then once you do it once, you watch people's confidence level light up. And then I go, now your job is to repeat it. Now you're gonna do it twice in a month. And then you build that muscle up. I don't care how many deals you do. I got in the wholesaling because I wanted to spend more time with my family. I, I never did it strictly for the money. I was just tired of working 70, 80 hours a week in a corporate job. I did it for the money. He, yeah, well, <laughs> it, we, we just, so, uh, so here's news for you guys. I didn't figure out this till I was 33. So I tried everything my parents did. It's not their fault, which we only had so many tools. And I went on a massive like learning expert before YouTube and all that stuff. And now people like your audience members have such an opportunity. There's so much information. You just got to pick the right source and then you got to take the action and move forward. There's so much money to make in this world, but you, you have to pick a plan and you, you're going to have to take a risk. That, that's just how it works in wholesaling. Obviously, Rick, you've been in the industry, you've been doing it for a while. You had the YouTube channel. Zach got into it. And then when you created Wholesaling Houses for Real and sort of, you know, the, promoted the channel and that, what was the decision? Who, who sort of come up with it? Did Was it at the dinner table one night? Zach's gone, Dad, I want to sort of blow this up a bit and make it a bit bigger. I, I want to, was that sort of the conversation or did it just sort of, how did it come about? Oh, that's a fun one. <laughs> well, I won't get the full story of it because there's some funny things on there. But uh, I made that basically. I made that group because I was I was sick of these gurus, and I, I was just so I, I was so sick of it. So uh, I basically I kind of just created the the group out of spite, more or less. Uh, starting out, I was just so upset at these Facebook groups. They were driving me so crazy because they they would not. I used to be in these Facebook groups, and I used to just help people out. And I kept getting removed because, hey, no, 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 no. You can't say that because that's in the course that we promote in the group. So you cannot say that. It's too, that's too good of info. And I'm like, fine, I'm just making my own group. So I made my own group. Obviously started with like, what, four or five people, right? Yeah. And I basically, what I did was I let anybody who wanted to do a free coaching call with me, unlimited. And uh, that blew it up because, I mean, how are you going to take advice from a 19-year-old, right? Yeah. But the advice I was saying people were doing deals and eventually people respected it and it just blew up to where it's at now. Um, and that's pretty much it. Like I've, um, I've had to prove every single way in the journey when we're teaching wholesaling mm -hmm. to everyone. Um, and the only way you can prove is by showing it, you know? So I started cold calling live in the group, started closing deals in front of everybody. And it was like, Oh, this info is legit. Yeah. And, uh, from there it's just, it's exponential. Right. And, uh, it's the largest wholesaling mastermind in the country. And, uh, that's it. It's the fastest. Yeah, so Zach came to me. So I had, so I had Zach to, you know, uh, he did marketing, he did acquisitions, he did dispositions. I, I worked him through the whole gamut of my company and he spent a lot of time before he even taught anyone. He had, he did a lot of deals and he came to me one day cause I was just so frustrated. I'm trying to help people on the internet and I keep getting like, people keep deleting it and like th these deals aren't real. And he goes, I'm going to create the largest Facebook group in the wholesaling industry. I just kind of yeah. looked at him. I'm like, my active members yeah, is the largest one. This guy can do it. 
And he started out with one guy. I have one guy you who's on a live. And, and you. then it was like two. And it was just like, and he just, he just went through the progression. And, and uh, to his credit, he just, I said, listen, I'm beyond frustrated how this industry is taught. Everything's like a, give me 10K and I'll show you how to do basics, a wholesaling. And then you find out they don't really have the skill set. They're just a coach. They don't even wholesale anymore. So I said, listen, as long as we can always do our business, I'm okay with this. I'm not going to be the guy who's does coaching full time. And then I skip wholesaling. So he went on that journey and he would say, uh, you know, dad be here, dad be there. I'm like, you know, yeah. that's, that's what I need. Says he's really good with that stuff. And then, um, you guys know he has a lot of energy and then he, he this kid, he will cold call anybody. Like oh. he'll call your mother, he'll call your dad, he'll do it and he'll convince them to do it. And I said, you know, you need to share that. So to this day, he still does it and people love it. He's the only one that will go on there. It, it's a I'm lot of work to go live. that will live stream a cold call. Yeah, live stream. Every okay. other one, they're recorded, they're agents. And uh, you gotta be fearless in this business. So he's he's got the right attitude and the right mindset. I'd like to tell you I had like this master influence on him, but he started paying attention around 13, 14. He's like, well, what do you do, dad? I'm like, let me show you son. And then I just started him out with some simple books. He really gravitated towards the books, asked quality questions. And then I just, hey, you know, he goes, how can I help? And that's how we launched our journey. And then he's about two years in the holes. And I go, man, you're really good at this. And then he tried the social media with other people. He's like, listen, we just got to take it to the masses. Let's change the business. And he goes, I'm going to create the largest group. Mm -hmm. I'm like, do it. That's it. So it's a fun story. Um, yeah, if you try and do something in someone else's group, you get blocked. I've been thrown out of that many groups. I'm like, hang on, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I'm nowhere near as fearless as Zach. I don't do like, you know, uh, content videos or anything. But just if you do anything outside of the outside of the box you get thrown out i'm like wow it's it's they are very tight a lot of the groups so um I, i'm actually in a networking facebook group and uh of an admin group and there's probably 45 50 groups in it and we share in each other's groups and cross promote within that that's part of the sort of plan to try and get that attitude out there that you're not competition you can actually uh you know this like you said rick there's plenty there's plenty of fish in the sea and there's other, you know, look, there's other podcasters and that not, they let me drop my podcast in their group and vice versa. And yeah, it's just, the attitude's got to change. It's not this scarcity. It's it's about an abundance mindset. There's, there's plenty for everyone. And one thing I notice as an Australian, you know, in, in you know, immersed in the United States is um, you guys share a lot of content and that that's, you know, Australians are really bad. We're behind with that. We're like, we're not showing our secrets. We're not, you know, whereas you guys, it's a part of your culture now, especially in this business, is to get stuff out on YouTube and, and some content. And I think it goes back to the individual. There's enough stuff just in your group that you don't need to spend a cent. You don't need to spend a cent. And then, like you said, Rick, once you've done a deal or two deals, then you can go out and spend some money and get the nice, you know, softwares and all this sort of stuff. And then you can just build your business from there because you do need to automate and delegate. And I think you were saying on your... On your um, your live yesterday that you were saying, look, you've got nothing wrong with people spending money on education once they're set up or mentorship, as long as the people are legit and they're in the trenches and they're doing it and they can teach you what you need to know right now, not just someone um, that's not, it's just a course and, and they're not, they're not actually doing it. So, you know, like you're not against people getting, you know, mentorship or going to Anthony Robbins and doing some mindset stuff. You, you're not against self um, improvement. It's just, like Zach said, it's probably more the dodgy right. ones that are out there taking advantage of people. Yeah, and that's that's a little bit of the problem um, in the business. So I just, I, listen, if you ever like, like watch Shark Tank, like all that stuff, all good businesses, you gotta go out and test the theory before you do ginormous investments. Wholesaling's no different. So you might as well learn the basic mechanics, go out, produce $100,000, and then you can, decide which way you want to kind of go on that journey to decide that day one before you've ever made a dime is a terrible, terrible decision. Yeah. So you just, you got to get out there, get some deals under contract, make a lot of mistakes and then make a profit. And then your journey has begun. But you got to so, also remember, also remember 
we are actually, we got the best advanced training in the country too. Correct. I have helped so many people go from a hundred K to a million a year off of our advanced topics at freeholsing.com. Yeah. So I just, it's crazy because a lot of people, they learn how to go from zero to a hundred. They don't go with anyone else. So we, we do teach how to scale from a hundred K to a million, but it's all like rugby, man. You, you, you like rugby, right? No, we're more Aussie rules footy. Um, <laughs> Aussie rules? I'm, I'm, yeah, in I, I'm in Melbourne. The rugby states, right. are, the rugby states are New South Wales and Queensland, but the rest of the states are Aussie rules footy. And um, yeah, not many Americans know much about it, but it's an unbelievable I, sport. I love watching. It's when, like when it's we like get that sport, TV. though. You know, um, I don't know it too well compared to rugby, but like, like wholesaling. If you're gonna play the sport, you're gonna get hit. Like you can get smacked. You can get okay? hit hard. And it's like anything, right? Like if you want to make a hundred K in wholesaling, you make a million dollars in wholesaling, you're playing the game. And if people expect to play the game and not get hit, maybe not physically hit, but like mentally hit, hit by a seller, hit yeah. by a question. It's the same thing. You're going to get hit. It's just how you deal with getting hit. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the people that go through it and get better, that's how you do it. You're yeah. A lot of times we're just teaching them to get up after you get hit. Yeah. So many times, like, like kids get in a contact sport and they get hit once. They're like, I don't want to do that anymore. Like, I can't like help you there. Like you've got the experience yeah. a few times and they go, Hey Rick, that was really tough. The seller was really nasty to me. I go, there you go. Get over it. Let's do it over again. I go, what's the worst they're going to do to you. They're going to say no or insult you. It's not a physical hit. Yeah. So this isn't Aussie football and stuff like that. You'll live. So that's why I always want people just to immerse themselves in wholesaling get hit a few times and then every time i go on the live you see it i'm like hey that's part of the norm of the course they're like really that's the norm yeah. i go yeah you're gonna get rejected and people like say nasty things to you if you can get through that and tolerate it wholesaling is amazing but it's all about mindset like yeah. you can tell someone to suck it up when someone's mean to you but if you really change your mindset it doesn't matter like whenever someone says a mean thing to, to me you know i always tell them i'm like hey my mama thinks i'm cool yeah and if you have that mindset it's like i don't care what anyone else thinks about me you have to have a solid mind, especially with the content stuff we do. Correct. The amount of trolls we got to deal with. I, I don't care what you say about it. My mama thinks I'm cool. That's all that matters. <laughs> and if you have that mindset, you're going to be ironclad to go through anything in this business. But so many people will pay these outrageous fees just to go through like a basic mindset. Yeah. And I tell them, I go, listen, you, there's tons of information out there for free. I love wholesaling. It is not for everybody. And I know that. And I think this business has been marketed. It's for everybody. That's why it has such a high failure rate. So we just say, listen, let's get you going. The number one problem people have when they get started wholesaling is they have no money to market, even if they want to do it, because they gave this guy all their money. And the guy goes, well, you got to spend five grand a month on marketing. He goes, well, I just gave you 10. He's like, well, you know, now you got to suck it up. And to me, like with us, we give you a running head start to do what you need to do. You can do this business with no money. you like, you can do it. I've done it a million times. It's just... Will it be more challenging? Yes. You're going to have to bring some more skills, a lot more hustle to the table. And that's where me and Zach come in. So the beauty of how we do coaching is we can tell everybody the truth. Yeah. So when someone goes, I can't find a deal, I go, what did you do specifically today to find a deal? Well, you know, I made like two or three, two or three phone calls. You're not going to get anywhere in wholesaling. Yeah. And I go, and you have to increase that activity massively. So every time we get into, you know how I say to people, I go like, don't complain, let's find solutions. You can complain all, I can't fix a complaint. I can fix your action and you have to be accountable for it. So um, high activity, especially in the beginning of wholesaling, talking to a ton of people, you'll make mistakes, but in the end you'll make money. And what we're really trying to do is get your confidence up. So you say, I can nail wholesaling. I'm very good at this. And the only way you can do it is by progressing. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes along the way. The worst thing you can do is wait two or three years and study it because yeah. then it's going to take you two or three years to probably take action. So just get into it. Dive. The people that do the best with us are the ones that literally just go, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm just going to do exactly what you say. That's it. The ones that have the problems are the ones that take our information, try to filter it to do what they want and what they don't want. And then they try to pick it apart. Like this isn't working. I go, well, you didn't call 200 people today. Remember that was the goal. 200 a day. Well, you haven't called anyone in a week. I'm like, okay, we're already a thousand behind. So um, those that want to take action, they do wildly successful. The ones that want to kind of do part of it, then it, it's a much bigger challenge for them. So, 
Yeah, there was a guy. There was a guy last week when I was listening to Zach, and he rings up, and he was all, you know, the, how do you do it, Zach? You know, people are mean to me. People do this. People, and you've said, well, hang on, hang on. <laughs> and he was, he, he went on for ages, and and I and Zach just said to him, listen, um, you know, have you what list are you pulling? He goes, oh, I went on prop seven. He goes, but I told you in the course to do this, this, and this. Did you do that? He goes, no. And he, then he starts whinging again, and Zach goes, but hang on, what about this and this? And he goes, no, nah, I didn't do that. He goes, have you even <laughs> gone through the course? He goes, no, nah, not really. And then by the end of it, the guy realised he, he'd been he sort of taken the course what he'd watched and then did his own thing. He, he, I think he even didn't he even um, use someone else's script. Oh yeah, okay, he's another guy. He paid fifty bucks for a cold calling script uh, that didn't work. And then he, I can go to anybody if you are not making a hundred thousand dollars a year in wholesaling real estate and you want <clears> to change it. I can, if I just talk to you and break down what you do, I always have this mantra in wholesaling. I say consistent action equals consistent results. So if you are inconsistently having results, that means you're inconsistently taking action. I can pick apart anybody in a nice way. If you tell me what you, what your marketing is, I can tell you how much money you make in wholesaling. I don't even, I like, that's it. So when somebody comes to me and say, I'm not getting any deals, it's not working. I'm like, okay. This is all like an algorithm for cold calling. Okay. What's the list? What's the script? And pretty much what's the skip tracing. Mm -hmm. If I look at these three things, I can tell exactly how your cold calling is. So if you're using a list that I said, don't do, and then you're using actually no. So I do tell people you can pull a list off prop stream, but the problem is you have to understand in prop stream, you should be making some money in this business because in prop stream, when you pull a high equity list, every guru says to pull a high equity list. So when you're in Houston, when you call this list, there's 10 or 15 other wholesalers calling that list and VAs, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I say go after your government list. The script, the simpler you make it, the better it is. And then the skip tracing, you get what you pay for sometimes. But consistent results come from consistent action. And if you're not consistently doing it, uh, that's the honest truth. But it's it's so we, uh, it's really cool because like us training VAs, I think that really changed the mindset of how we taught people. Because VAs are from a completely different culture. English is their second language. And if I can teach them how to cold call, and what I've learned from them is I have to give them in a list. This, 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 and this. I moved that over to people and it changed everything. <clears throat> um, and th that, that's definitely something I found out. So yeah, I, that's why at Free Wholesaling, I tell you to do this, this, and this. And let everyone hop to me, hop on, talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, it'd be like uh, Graham teaching like Aussie football to like guy knows American football. And then I try to put my, my interpretation into your sport. I'm never going to learn it. You're probably just going to kick me off the team. Yeah, Whereas but, you have to yeah. go there and I just got to look at Graham. I go, just tell me every step. Like what's the first thing? Like everything. I find people that have no real estate experience actually do the best in wholesaling because there's no like habits. And if they'll open the receptors and be open to it. But the problem is this business has created a lot of distrust with information, people being disappointed, empty promises. And that's where we're trying to fill the void in there. As I said, wholesaling is brutally simple. It's a fundamental skill. And if you master it, you can apply it to almost all areas of your life. But you have to simplify it. Remember that guy in the hurricanes that was from Australia, the punter with the mm -hmm. tattoos? Yeah. He didn't know a lick of football, but he played Aussie rules football and he could kick. His kicking was So amazing. literally, he didn't know how football worked, but they just gave him one thing to do. Hey, take it and just kick it far. And he was one of the best in the country. And that's all he did. And then he got better at it. He learned, yeah. but like, that's what you have to do. Like you might not know the rules of the game, but if I just tell you, just do this one thing, mm -hmm. that's it. So when we did our 30 day challenge, trying to get people to their first deal in 30 days, yeah. whenever we did an accountability, I'm like, how many phone calls do you make today? Like, I kind of skipped them today. <laughs> I was tired. I go, get off the phone. Yeah. It's non-negotiable. Like that's the skill set I think all us humans can work on. If you really want to get something done, I don't care if it's weight loss, your business, you want to get more wholesale deals. If you set up a plan and you start negotiating with yourself, it's just like working out. And nobody wants to get up and like go to the gym. It's not fun, but you look at the end result. If I can flip three deals this month, I can put another $50,000 in my bank account. It'll make me more financially free. I can spend more time with my family. I'm going to get through the pain of these 200 calls a day. And that's what we try to get people to focus on and just simplify it. We don't care about your logo, your LLC, any of that. Do you have a property under contract? And if not, what are you doing actively today to get that result?
That's it. There's no point in spending all the other time. Don't worry about your website. Don't worry about your email. Honestly, as long as you have a cell phone and if you have an internet search browser, you can, anybody can do wholesaling. Yeah, Period. absolutely. Keep it simple. We've got a couple of questions for you guys. Um, Lorenzo, did you want to just jump in and ask a question? Yeah, for sure. If that's cool. Yeah, so, no worries. Uh, yeah, Rick and Jack, you were talking about mindset a bit earlier. What are some of your all's favorite books on mindset? All right, so I'm I'm always weird. I'm a Gen <laughs> Z, so I'm different. Books are great. I think Gen Z too, bro. I think interviews are way better. Like if I can get in somebody's mind of him talking for four or five hours, I don't think any auto autobiography can beat that. Like Elon Musk did not write down his mindset tips. They interview him, he talks about it. A lot of autobiographies are people who do it. Um, that's one thing I've always found. Jeff Bezos never wrote a book. Uh, he might've written a book, but like, not like a mindset book, but when people interview him on mindsets, um, that changes a lot. So I guess any autobiography of any great entrepreneur, but I, I have honestly found that just watching interviews of people that I really look up to in the greats, uh, on their mindsets, the best one. And I, I'm not, I'm not this guy telling you, you should read a billion books. That, that's, that's kind of a guru thing more or less. Um, I like listening to interviews a lot better because it, I found it a lot more inspirational. So, um, I like interviews better. So I'm going to let you in a little secret, man, dude. I, I'm not a big book reader fan because I, I guess school scarred me and it was, it's, it's, so you see a lot of people like, uh, just learn to read five or 10 pages a day. Anything you have to do by force, you're, you're going to give up on. So but I would um, say anything by Jim, Jim Rohn. Yeah, I have a ton of them. books and I like them, but in my experience is I've let I've met a lot of the people who write these books and you hear the backstory on the book. Yeah, the, the books are they're edited, they're made to sell. The publisher changed them. The and he's are, right, dude. It's like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've talked to uh, Kiyosaki, how he did Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You would be that book was written to sell it. It had yeah. it, it serves a great purpose, but. Um, I love Tony Robbins, uh, Awaken the Giant Within. It's a book this thick and it scared the heck out of me. But if you read it, it's probably one of the most content rich yeah, books. Old this, look, I picked uh, it up. In a, so I picked it up when I was 17 or 18. How old is this book? And I thought it was, he, every one of his books is like 500 pages plus. Um, well, I would tell you any interview you watch from Tony Robbins from 91 is older. This book's older than me. The problem is this is edited like crazy. This pro this his drafts probably three times bigger than this. Yeah. But when he interviews about mindset, it's com it's unedited. There's no publisher gave him the axe on it. That's why I like it. But yeah. And plus, it's like real time. You can get a lot more information. But the older guys, they have books and they can't really do much interviews. So um, I like Earl Nightingale. He's really good. Jim Rohn, um, Zig Ziglar, like some of the old school guys. I would say those books are good. But like. Anything's off of interview yeah, you know? and anything you can find on Jim Rome, which he's, he's wonderfully all over YouTube yeah. guy was so far ahead of his time. It still gives me the shivers to this day in the sixties and seventies. He was promoting what we're talking about today. Yeah. He was so far ahead of his time. If I had to pick one guy, cause that's the guy who taught Tony Robbins. Amazing. But I love audible books. Um, I love podcasts. I think there's too many podcasts out there. There's too much information and um, we can speed it up too. So we There's can guys that like clip out the best motivational stuff and the best mindset stuff yeah. for like three hours straight. Yeah. And you put it on a podcast while you're in a car. It's amazing. So and there's something about their voice and the, the, the tone of their inflection. Tonality you cannot get off of a book. Yeah. So it's books have their purpose, but most books are like a 10 to 15 year culmination of someone's story. Yeah. And sometimes the information, although it's great, it's just not useful for you at the time. Like I, we, we show you some of the books we picked up in the 60s and 70s that everybody thinks they created this I'll magic you, thing. Last one. Can't learn fishing from a book, right? Yeah, you, you really you, you can read them all you want, man. It's just uh, you got to get into it. So I love today's technology. Um, interviews are great, especially when they're raw and they're uncut because you, you get into uh, the meat of it. So so I guess I guess what you guys are saying is. And this is another thing, the way that, you know, 20, 30 years ago when Anthony Robbins was bringing out books that are this thick, we had a bit more time on our hands. Things have moved so quick now, you just don't get the mm -hmm. time. So you've got to have your headset on while you're doing your weights, listening to you know, <laughs> yeah. 
my books and podcasts. I, I, I never thought of it that way, Zach, but that, that's really true, is you're getting them talking straight out of their head where, you know, on interviews and podcasts, whereas in a book, they've had time to sit down, they've wrote it, it's been edited, and that, that won't be popular, we'll cut that out, we'll take that out. So that, that's a really good point. Like, you get straight... It's like if you watch Elon Musk on uh, Joe Rogan, he's talking there. They're having a drink, yeah. they're having a drink, and you know, just, <laughs> all sorts of stuff. All sorts of stuff, yeah. And there's a few f bombs flying around and all the rest of it. But you get you get him right there present. So that's yeah. I'm, I'm going to jot that down. That's a really good point because you know who who's got time to to read books the size of that one that you just showed on the screen? It's just not you just don't get the time anymore. So. That's why we love doing lives just like this, because you can ask a direct question and there's like, you know, you're going to get the truth. I don't have time to prepare a statement or anything like that. So anytime you get someone live, you can really, you, you can get the information you're seeking that hopefully will help you out. Yeah. But you gotta be careful with it because I mean, we've been pitched pretty much all, not every major network, well, a lot of major networks be on TV shows. And we, they wanted us to write things where when I go on interviews, I can't say this, this, or this, or mm. I can't like promote this, or I can't say this certain thing. So a lot of interviews sometimes are kind of from uh, people in real estate are a little weird. Um, yeah, they read your rules yeah, before real estate, you can't say this, yeah. you can't do this. So you gotta be careful. You can't promote this. I'm just like, yeah. we, we just steer we said the no other way. Some that's good why, deals. Yeah, that's, that's why money, we do but... six lives a week because people like last night, they get the information and then they take oh. the information and then they ask questions back. And that's the best way, in my opinion, to learn anything. Yeah, just what are your like this. Sorry, you go, Lorenzo. Yeah, yeah I want to ask, what's your all's take on live meetups and in-person masterminds? I think they're stupid. I'm just being completely honest, man. I, I, so you're in a different crowd. So we're, than me. we're a little bit different. So yeah, I'm one of the. So I'm an old school guy. So I I, I grew up in this business in my mid thirties and we couldn't do stuff like this. It was like, it was to do something like this. You had to spend 20, $30,000. So I would go to meetups and I had to build a network the old school way. And I personally enjoy that. I get my son's side of the view. I have, it's not efficient, <laughs> but like, it's not um, like you, as you know, Greg, like you create connections and relationships with people and uh, I'll be honest with you. I enjoy that part of it. It's the only part I miss a little bit on the lives because sometimes physically touching someone and being with them does create an extra energy. The problem with most of the lives and the masterminds you talk, they're not masterminds. A mastermind is an organic gathering of people that all share unconditionally with each other. So what they truly are, most of them are coaching sessions. And the reality is why they put everybody in the same room is because you create this infectious energy and you just get the upside and it's really easy to sell people. I've sat through all these trainings and how they do it. If you can get people together for a natural mastermind, it's very powerful. But the reality is 90% of the masterminds out there are paid for masterminds, which are backdoor coaching. And you ever hear the people go, oh, everybody in here does $50 million a year. I'm like, really? That's amazing. It's yeah. like, there's no vetting, but I love the interaction, but it is somewhat inefficient. I have, I have about 50 wholesalers that are doing about over 3 million in revenue on my phone, text and call me all the time. I, I've never been to one meetup, one mastermind ever my entire life. I got pretty much every single one calling me on speed dial. So I, I I've kind of yeah. not believed it. Like Graham, the reason I'm talking to you is because you have a podcast, right? Like I just, I, I'm telling you it's, it's a lot more effective creating a personal brand than flying over the country and everything. And we, people are like, Oh, go network, you get deals. And I, we get so many deals sent to us just from doing podcasts and stuff like, like from our own channel yeah, that we, I just we could never do it in person. There's yeah. no way, but it's, he, here's the reality of it is I'm kind of old school. He's new. He looks at more efficient ways. That's why we work so well together. But like I crave the interaction and relationship is just because that's how I was kind of brought up. Yeah. But the reality is by doing that, I'm mostly feeding my ego. I'm not feeding my business. And once you recognize that, because Graham, you know, one of my biggest sayings is you have to lose your ego in wholesaling. The reason why most speakers, coaches, mentors go in front of those groups, it really, really feeds their ego. It's that's just why the I truth. Don't like it. 
it's it's an ego. Fest. So it's it's a little bit selfish on my ego, and like I listen to him, he goes, "That's terribly inefficient." If we, so he goes, "If we do fifty meetups across the country, it's going to cost a ton of time, money. We're going to lose business in our flipping business. Your ego is going to feel better, but at the end of the day, we're not. It's not going to help us move closer to our goal." Yeah. So there you go, Lorenzo. Um, the other question we had yeah, in the chat was, good. "What you were talking about government lists before, guys?" What are the best government lists? What, what do you think are the best government lists to pull? So right now, I would say three years ago, no one ever pulled government lists. And it was so it was so much money. It was so easy. Yeah. I love government lists. So my favorite ones right now are code violations, probates, water shutoffs, fire damage properties, arrest record list, IRS debt lien list, credit card debt lien lists. And then I would sprinkle in some pre-foreclosures that you get for free. Evictions. Uh, those are evictions are another one, you know, um, they're okay right now, but like it just it depends on the state, right? Yeah. I would say those eight or nine are pretty good. Uh, I don't think you go wrong with it. And then if you reverse drive for dollars that list, it's money. So and how do you like, pull those lists, Zach? From the government, it's a government list. Clerk of the court, uh, code enforcement, the fire department, the uh, public utility department. Air, you just literally, pretty much if you go to city hall, they're all there. And that's what I teach everyone to do because when you got no money, you don't have much options. And I've kind of blown up all the options for everyone. And we are the only people on YouTube that ever talk about it. And I only knew how to do it because you did all these old school tactics yeah, yeah, and yeah. they still work. So but, I, yeah, but I, I would, I would physically go down and pull all that. And he's just like, you know, we, we can do this online and stuff like that. So like I'm an old giant, I love like wholesaling relationships, but like I learned, um, as we can talk about in Dispo today, you don't want a huge, you don't want a relationship with your cash buyer. It'll actually tax your business. Yeah. Um, but in the beginning, you have to decide where you want to put your energy. I'm not saying visiting like a mastermind or a group up. Just understand there's there might be a hidden message or a course in there, and if you recognize it up front, a lot of the RIA groups, if you come to the states. You go there, there's a lot of seasoned like investors and they're waiting on the fringes to prey on a lot of people that are brand new. Hey, I'll partner up on a deal with you, but they, you never get any paperwork for it. And then they ghost you and then they look for the next mark. So yeah. you can pull these lists online too. I, I all my live streams, someone asked me how to do it. I just, I just pop it up really quick. It works really well. Your, your little government is driving around getting complaints about ugly houses in your, in your city and they're putting fines on it, which doubles the motivation. I, Everyone should be pulling them if you got no money. And it works. I'm biased to probates on that list. So, What if I'm buying about 1,000 leads from Batch every week? Do you think there's going to be a high chance that I'm getting duplicates off of the government websites? Not really. There's, I have reverse engineered a lot of them. I love Batch, but I've told everyone, if you're pulling a Batch lead list, then pretty much everyone can pull that list too. I have some counties on probates where people pass away. There's only three wholesalers that get that list. I compete against three wholesalers versus a hundred in a market. It's so much easier. I, it's so easy, man. It's like if uh, Michael Jordan's got to compete against two other basketball players, it's simple, right? Yeah. Now, if I'm uh, another basketball player, let's say I'm like a uh, Scotty Pippen, right? And I, it's easier for me to beat two other guys out. But if I have to be better than 50 other guys, it's a little harder. Yeah. So where, wherever there's, yeah. So th these government lists, like for the most part, they're free. You do get a little resistance getting them because they get a little more traffic. That makes it better. Yeah. So to overcome the resistance, just be persistent. And guys, the fundamentals of wholesaling is you have to find someone that has a motivating factor and it can't be price. Price is not a motivation. So you need to find tools to where you can point towards where the motivation is. There's nothing better in a government list. I'm all for paid services, stuff like that. But I tell a lot of people just start with the list and work through it. And here's the key to it. We always have thousands and thousands of people in our database. The key is if I'm on for an eviction or say I'm on for a probate or I'm on for a pre foreclosure or a code violation, it doesn't mean I'm selling the house today. And you have to understand that as a wholesaler. So time and circumstance always change. Most people wind up on code violation for a high grass and stuff that have multiple violations. They have a 90% of probability of selling that house probably in the next 18 to 24 months. Yeah. I want it in the next 30 days, but if in your business long-term understanding, if that house is in that bad a condition, eventually they're going to sell. So you just got to stay on the radar, simple text. 
uh, a simple a call, a simple note on the door, and they just take time. So if you constantly have thousands of leads understanding, you have no idea when that one lead's going to drop and they're going to make that decision to sell. So how do I stay in front of their face to get it done? That's where I've done really yeah. well in wholesaling. And you sometimes, like probates, I tell you, it's, it's not sexy. It takes a long time, but it's not expensive. If you wait it out a year, you will get really good deals. I found most wholesalers want to take the probate down like on one phone call. It doesn't work that way. Six phone calls on average is what it takes, six connections. So by getting these lists, I want you to understand you build a funnel and then you work through them. Every now and then you get someone's like, yep, I'm ready to sell. But what about those 90% of the people that didn't say yes? You just follow up with them. Remember, time and circuit. I'm not selling my house today, but something might happen tonight where I wake up tomorrow and go, oh, I'm selling my house. You, we have seen massive changes in the last two years. Think about all those leads people had two years and they're like, well, they didn't sell today. I promise you they sold within 24 months of when you first reached out to them. So a lot of these leads, once you pay for the skip tracing until you do cold calling, keep them in your rotation until they absolutely say, I am not selling, or they say, you have to take me off your list, period. Just one one thing. Um, could you just go through maybe half a dozen, of the, the top half a dozen, Zach, just a bit slower? Because I think there's a few people trying to write it down and it was- Yeah. Yeah, so th this is really simple. So The ones that you believe and, are the best half a dozen in, in those yeah. government lists. Yeah, so to finish Lorenzo's thing, the only problem when it comes to uh, government lists and if you shouldn't pull them or that not, if you pull every high equity lead where the owner, where the person's owned it for at least two to three years, government lists are probably not your best bet because you're kind of doing such a wide net, except for probates because... You do probates, you send the letters that we teach. It's great. Uh, but yeah, here, let's go off of the top one. So if I have somebody who just comes up to me, hey, I live in, you know, Memphis, Tennessee. How do I get my first deal, right? I honestly would tell you, pull the code violation list, code enforcement department, also called neighborhood services. Quick tip, if you're in Memphis, you should do the city of Memphis code enforcement and get the code violations there. And then there's the Shelby County code enforcement department. Two of them, that's double. Most people don't know that you get double the list and they're getting complaints from old ladies about ugly house in their neighborhood. Oh, my neighbor, he's got tall grass. It's, it's an eyesore, you know? And then it's like, okay. And they put a fine on the property. It's a great one. Literally, you got old ladies and guys looking at ugly houses in the neighborhood when they take their little walks and they're the complaining and they're <clears> basically <throat> walking for dollars for you. You got a hundred old people walking around looking for ugly houses and complaining all day. That's like a hundred employees. It's money and the list is free. So code enforcement, get all active uh, code violations. I prefer tall grass, structural damage and mold or mildew. Uh, next one here is probates, people that passed away. Go to the local county clerk of the court and then you can kind of go from the probate court and see that you know John Smith passed away. Um, Sarah Smith is the heir. You get her address, you can skip trace her, get her phone number, call her up, see if she wants to sell that property. Pretty simple. Uh, the next one is, I like liens. I, I really am a big fan of liens. So you can do tax liens. Usually people don't pay their tax in three years. That's public records. You just go off of liens for taxes. Water shutoffs, you go to the utility department. If you're not living with water and you're running in your house, toilet, shower, it's miserable. You definitely want to get rid of it or it's just a vacant house, right? Mm -hmm. The unfortunate part about vacant properties is you have to pay for that list um, because the United States Postal Service only lets 501c3s get it. So you have to have like a paid service to get it. But a lot of vacant properties, the water's not even running in the house or the lights. So the utility department, if they're not paying, the lights aren't on and the water's not on. So that's a quick hack. Uh, just ask for all water shutoffs or utilities if you really want. Just give me a list of all the properties that the water is not currently turned off or they haven't paid uh, the utility. There's no account set up. And then from there, you get fire damage properties, properties that went on fire. They're sometimes called red tags. Uh, go to a local firehouse, fire department. Hey, can I get a list of all the houses you went on calls for? Um, and then from there, you, you, just, you can kind of just run through the rest of them. There's liens from the IRS, from the Department of Revenue. Uh, there's a million. I would probably stick to code violations, probates, water shadows, and fire damage properties starting out uh, and then kind of expand it from there. Beautiful. And do you, do you pull answer. this from the website or do you have to call somebody who works for the county to get that list? Here's the problem. There is what? 1,000, 2,000 counties? 
3,500. There's 3,500 counties in the United States and they're all run differently. So some have a public code violation list. You can just pull it up really quick. And some you have to call uh, smooth, like, you know, just uh, be very sweet to the lady there for like hours and hours. And then she'll finally give it to you. Like deliver donuts to them yeah. and exchange like in a person. bribe, a food bribe. You can't do a money bribe, but it's. You can do it virtually, though. Yeah. If you call, request it, you're good to go. And worst case scenario, we have a law in the United States called the Freedom of Information Act, which gives pretty much since a taxpaying citizen can get public information of what your government is currently doing. And you get to file that sometimes and you get the list. Um, there's a million ways around it. You guys you have to do that each time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you guys have got content videos on this, haven't you? In the in the I, with Rick YouTube. I channel. can go for hours on this. You know uh, this. I can go for hours on this. I'll it's all at freeholsting.com. If, if anyone that's watching this wants to go on to, hasn't been on Flip with Rick, yeah. like, there's not one topic you don't cover, is there? Like, you'd have, Zach, you'd have a, a video where you actually tell people how to do this, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Every single one. Yeah, and we, and we walk in the detail, and the, the reason we create it is to help people out because you, you can't always spend. Well, that's half of it. Yeah, the other yeah, half yeah. is I'm sick of explaining it to people, so I'm like, just go here, and I talk about yeah, it. Yeah, we show it, and I yeah. said, so every time I go on the live, I go, how far have you gone through freeholeselling.com? They're like, I've kind of grazed through it. I'm like, I, I can tell like by the way you're asking this. I know Lorenzo hasn't gone to freeholeselling.com because he would know exactly how to pull each one. So and I'm the, saying that nicely, but yeah. like, I can tell anyone that hasn't gone through it. But what? Yeah. So you just register there. There's no upgrade. You just, you put in your email and then you can go through like start to finish and everything goes in sequential order. And then we even give you a 30 day challenge. If you want to follow us like day by day to get your first deal, that's how we do it. And the thing is you watch it at your own convenience. You can watch it in fast word. You can watch it in slow motion. You can go back and replay it. And that that's how I like to learn. I do like the live stuff. I just think getting like the fundamentals, like if you're going to learn math, like you could go through some basic cue cards. Like I'm in the process of like learning how to play cards because I'm interested because I skip a, like a lot of poker and I get killed in it. So I go and take the basic rudimentary on like all the hands and everything you do in poker. And then I go to the games, I get my butt kicked and I'm like, okay, that's how I learn. And then I ask questions. I go, Hey, how did you know? I, I, how did you know I would fold? He's like, Oh, you, you kind of like, you squint your eye. I'm like, oh my God. Man, you do, and you that, that's kind of how we do wholesaling too. It's like, you got to just get the fundamentals and get through it. And then as you learn, then you can ask really like much more advanced questions. Me and Zach can always tell by the quality of the questions the person's asking us if they've gone through the course material. And that's I tell people, I go, don't lie to me because I can look it up. I can tell how many of the modules they've actually gone through by their, their uh, watch time on it. But so yeah. And then kind of brings back to the topic today of dispositions. You go through that course, I'll literally show you the pretty much the three or four key tenets to f selling any deal really fast. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's pretty simple. You Plus, know, we I, spent two hours on it last night. So if you go to like Flip with Rick, you can even go into it. And we went into like really detailed. And the really cool thing is teach it. And then people ask questions live. And if you have a question, Lorenzo, I guarantee a thousand people behind you have the same question. So I tell people there's no bad question you can ask. Yeah. But when they need more information, I go, listen, when we get off this, go over to freewholesaling.com and do a little bit deeper dive and then hop back on. And I promise you, you're going to have like 30 like severe questions to ask me. There'll be better questions. That's how you learn. Like, so us talking like this is much more interactive and we're more receptive to where if you ever sat through school and someone just lectured you, it's like in one ear and out the it's other. It's probably like the, the lives. You know, Graham knows it's, it's impossible to reach me outside of these things. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've got to tag. I tag myself into stuff in the group, and I put pictures of Conor it's McGregor. Impossible. Um, you know, check your DMs. But this is what I'm saying, Lawrence. So what I'll do is I'll put it in the chat. The wholesaling course, the Flip with Rick YouTube channel, because they're amazing. Like I always bang on about. Rick did a a YouTube video on uh, work. You know, picking the right titles office, and I reckon I made the mistakes that he said every time through there. And if you watch that and you follow that, you'll never make that those mistakes. And and there's what over a thousand videos in there, how to get government lists, how to pull the best list off PropStream, all this sort of stuff. So I'll chuck it in the chat. I just want to get moving with the dispositions because we're talking a lot of acquisitions, but we haven't got on the dispositions yet. So yeah. Rick, Rick's fresh off a, um, <clears throat> working with uh, dis, 
doing dispo through realtors yesterday. So what I'll do is get started. Uh, the first thing that, you know, the first question people ask is, Rick and Zach, how do I, how do I build a cash buyer list? That's probably always the first generic question you get. And I mean, like you can break that down, you know, like I said, that you've probably got 30 videos on, on that. But for someone that's brand new, how do you get, if you were coaching someone, like you're coaching me right now, where would I start? I mean, I know the free wholesaling course, but what's the, what's the best thing to do to, to, to um, start building a cash buyers list? What, what would be your advice? That's an easy one. So first of all, you gotta look at what a cash buyer is if you wanna go find them, right? There's cash buyers either one or two things. And I've always found this, this is a honest truth I found in this business. A cash buyer, 99% of the time, this is how I can find if somebody is a cash buyer or not, is by why they're looking to buy the property. I have honestly found, and this, I honestly had to find this out myself, you know? Like, you never taught me that. Like, I had figured that a cash buyer is either gonna be a landlord or a flipper. Pretty much that's it. I, there's a land bankers out there, but like, honestly, 99% of your cash buyers are gonna wanna flip it or hold it as a rental. <clears throat> that's it. If you burr it, sub two, that is a landlord more or less or a flipper, right? Correct. So they're either a landlord or a flipper. If you talk to somebody who says they're a cash buyer and they don't give you one of those reasons, they want to flip it or they don't want to, or they want to rent it out, you know, they are probably another wholesaler, right? Um, so that's what I've on, honestly found. Now, if I know that I got to look at it both ways. So let's look at these two types and see how I find them. So the first one, a landlord, if I'm a landlord and I buy properties and then I rent them out, how am I going to reach out to that person? the four rents, right? Because they're renting out their properties. So if I'm finding these four rents that this guy's listing his property for rent, cause he's a landlord and you know, Sarah Smith, the realtor is listing it. I'm going to look up who's the owner, John, you know, John, uh, Smithfield and Josh, John Smithfield's owns six properties. He bought this month for rentals. Whoa. Let's go reach out to him. He looks legit. He's bought in six properties. Hey man, what's up? Like are you looking to buy any more properties? Yeah. I use them with my realtor. Well, well, why don't you try to buy them off market? Oh, I, I heard about that on bigger, but you explain it. He looks up wholesaling. He's like, I'm in. And he's some deals. And he's like, this is like 20% below what my realtor, I got, I don't have to pay all these commissions. This is insane. I've, I have made so many landlords, so many money, so much money from just usually buying properties on the market than this. It's amazing. Right? Um, so that's the first part. Like if I'm going out here and I'm looking for a landlord cash buyer, go where they're at, right? If I'm going to go and find somebody that's like really into a, uh, like if I want to find somebody who's a big fan of the Miami Dolphins, I'm just going to go to the stadium on a football game and find them. Like they're right, they're all there. Okay. Not all of them, but like a lot of them, right? Um, you just got to go to where they're all together. And there's, there's five key ways I found cash buyers. And then you got the flippers, right? Prop stream batch has ways to find it, but I'll, I'll just give you the five, right? There's auctions, Facebook groups, cash sales, uh, four rents and then basic. So wait, auctions, Facebook groups, cash sales, agents, and then the four rents. Those are the five ways to find cash buyers. So if you're going through all of them, if you have money, you can do the ones that are free, right? I tell everyone, if you are in person right now, you should all go to your property auctions. And that's something no one really talks about. They're a lot says. of fun. I, 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 there's nothing better to me than an auction because I get a mastermind I get investors well, and I get auction. cash buyers. Go ahead. So it's an auction. So it's a property that's being listed, usually a multifamily deal, maybe eh, maybe five units, four units, right? There's 50 people trying to bid on this, you know, four unit property, right? That got foreclosed. There's gonna be 50 people at that auction if it's a metro market, right? That means there's 50 people that have cash right now. They're looking to buy this for a rental or a flip, right? Guess what? It's an auction. Only one person's gonna win. That means 49 people are going to be sad they didn't buy that property yeah. and they have the cash ready to buy more real estate. Shake my hand. Hey, what, how are you? What, what, what are you looking to do? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't get, but like, I, I'm trying to sell this deal, this deal. You get 49 cash buyers in what? 30 minutes and it's free. You just pull up there yeah, and, and they're I, all qualified. Yeah, Every major market has some sort of auction. Yeah. And the auctions take place in front of the property. So it's like, it, Our market's got 200,000 people in it. And there's probably two auctions right now on a Saturday, yeah, every Saturday. And so I used to take him when he started out, I'm like, look at this. And his job is to go around and just talk to everybody, get emails, get phone numbers. And to piggyback on what you said yesterday, guess who are also there. 
realtors bidding for their clients. And that's how we found that little secret. So it's like, it's guys, you just got to understand where to look for him, exactly what he's saying. And They're once there. you understand that, it's like, okay, now I know how to attack it. And that that's what I need to look for. So, so many people complicate it. You're just looking for cash buyers. The problem is the word cash buyer today, Graham, is everybody codes themselves as a cash buyer. Your job as a wholesaler is to vet them to find out if they're really a cash buyer. Unfortunately, 70% of the people you talk to, 75%, they'll say they're cash buyers, they're not. There's this big, there's big guru groups that claim they get lending and then they pretend they're cash buyers to people on Facebook groups. And I've had them on a couple of my deals. It's so easy to figure out if they're real or not because I ask, hey, give me a proof of funds. And it's a 20 year old kid. And I, I can pretty much assume, you know, yeah. Um, and he's a 20 year old kid. He's got this nice little hat on and, um, he's like, I'm a cash buyer. I'm like, okay, send it to me. And it's his guru's name on it. I'm like, your name's not on the thing. You're not a legit, like yeah. this isn't a cash buyer. That's a hard money loan from your guru. It's hilarious. So you got to understand what's a legit cash buyer or not. And I, you always have to ask the right questions. And if you go through this qu list of questions, it's impossible for someone to try to daisy chain your deal. First of all, the most important one is how many properties have you bought for cash in your own name this year? If it's a fake one, they're never going to say it. Do you have the bank account in your personal name right now? Some of them do, yeah. but they will never show you how many properties they bought in the past month. A legit cash buyer doesn't really care and you can look them up pretty easy. Um, so yeah, we go through it. Auctions, Facebook groups. I have ad copy. You just post in Facebook groups. You probably get 10 cash buyers every time you post, you can do it once a day. You can DM cash buyers. It's really easy. Cash sales, people that buy properties cash, you just have a VA cold calling them agents you kind of talked about that yesterday but just reach out to real estate agents for cash sales and then from there the four rents it's really easy to sell a deal most people just really confuse it so the the most important part when you go through is the vetting process we teach yeah. the whole thing in detail freeholesling.com but remember you don't want a relationship with your cash buyers because they will leverage it against you like mm -hmm. it's they're, they're really good so what happens is you ask your questions in order of importance. Why? It's like cold calling. I don't want to spend 10 minutes with you if you don't have any cash. Yeah. So, hey, listen, what types of properties have you bought any? Hey, can I get a proof of funds? 90% of the time, the reaction of the proof of funds will tell you if you're ever going to do business with a person. Oh, why would you ever need that? I expect whenever I buy a property from even a wholesaler, if they don't ask me for a proof of funds, they probably are not in direct yeah. contact with the seller on a contract. When people get like, that's very personal information. No, it's not. Just show me a screen app or give me the front statement the last 30 days. Or if they letter. can't produce it. I don't show you how much money I got. Well, show me a letter. You have 500K right yeah. now. Right? If they can't produce it, you've just saved yourself a ton of time. Okay. And then the last important yeah. factor I want you guys to understand is we love cash buyers. I could. I don't care how many people you have on your list. Quantity does not impress me. Actually, it scares me. You only need 10 or 15 quality people to keep your business actively running as a wholesaler. I personally look for the avatar, the type of person. I love selling to someone that can't find stuff on MLS, has cash, is super handy, likes to do repairs for themselves, and buying the house for a family member or a friend. They will typically pay me top, top dollar and follow all my commands. Now give me a guy that's bought like 30 or 40 properties for me or somebody else. I find them to be the most difficult cash buyers and they think you, Graham, you should take a discount to do business with me. I try not to sell the same person more than three or four properties in one given year because I want the best return top dollar. But here's, yeah, the last part too is, this is really important because with dispositions, I think a lot of people think they cap their mind with things. They like you love David, David Goggins. David Goggins says you have a governor in your head that stops you from reaching where you can actually be. You kind of you go sixty percent of where you can actually go and you can actually push forward. A lot of people think, oh, I can only make twenty, thirty k on this deal, and we show you we can make seventy, eighty, ninety k on an assignment deal, and it happens all the time. And it all comes down to the quality of your cash buyer. But here's the problem: a lot of people think I can't make eighty k because the cash buyer is not going to be okay with it. If you ask your cash buyer, are you okay with me making $120,000 on this assignment deal? And you know, you're only making 10. If they say, no, I'm not comfortable with you making that much money. It's not a good cash buyer. A cash buyer should never care about your assignment fee. But unfortunately I found five to 10% of cash buyers that are qualified are upset. If you make over 10 K 
So you don't want to deal with them because once you hit that 80, 90 K deal, it's never, it, you're never going to get it because your cash buyer is going to blow up at the end and you're going to lose that deal. Um, so it's, you double close too. Yeah, but so just, whatever they say, Oh, I, Hey Zach, I saw you bought that property for 50 grand. You're telling us a hundred. You're not making 50 grand off me. I'm like, just don't even negotiate. Just get them out. Yeah. Because that's like going to uh, like a retailer like Walmart and go, well, you know, I'm going to buy this shirt. I know you only made it for five bucks. I'm only going to pay you six. Do not negotiate. Yeah. It, it's not going to work. I'm just telling you, look for someone that buys a few properties, has some money, and they'll pay a lot more. When I used to, in the beginning, I negotiated heavily with guys. They buy 40 or 50 deals from me. And every deal they bought, they wanted a deeper and deeper discount. It just got to the point I couldn't do it anymore. And then they're like, well, Rick, I, you know, I took you to dinner. We went fishing together. Our kids played together. I'm just like, uh-oh. I mistaked him as a friend. And so we don't do that anymore. So I tell everybody I work with, have a relationship with your cash buyer, but don't get, if the minute you make it personal, they're, they're working you. So I agree. we have a professional relationship and you have to honor that first, especially when you do your wholesaling. So for that reason, I don't like to sell to the guy that buys 50 properties a year because he's going to demand a huge discount and he's usually very sharp with his skill set. And as a new wholesaler, you can't, I got taken advantage of my first two years. I gave yeah. properties away. Like I just wanted to get deals and move them. So now we've come to a much more, robust advanced system. So Zach broke down the different categories where we find cash buyers. And there's categories of cash buyers on top of that. They're, they're, I can go deep into, I can go deep into everything. The problem is I don't want to complicate it for everyone. Yeah. I, I can, I can really deep dive everything, but I, I can also make it simple. Right. So it's just, there's different ways around it. Right. So, so I always qualify. Do I have a massive rehab project or is this one kind of ready for rental? Yeah. And if you just, most houses fall in 95% of those categories, but don't be giving the rehabber your rental ready properties. Cause like yeah, you you're, it's your never going to work. So it's like in the beginning, I used to send everybody everything. Now I'm like the rehabbers. I focus on the rehabbers, the landlord guys. I know exactly what they want. They want to know the cash flows. And if you guys can cater like doing those offerings, it works really yeah. well. And so like, when, so yesterday we talked about what, like realtors, if you're going to work in realtor world, let realtors talk to realtors because us wholesalers, we don't speak, I don't speak realtor language. I'm actually really bad at it. I have no problem yeah. paying a realtor 3% because on average I'm going to get 10% more and then they do all the vetting. They actually make your life a lot easier. As Zach said, I found the cash buyer agents with the realtors by accident at auctions, I noticed there was a group of five or six realtors and they're just bidding. I'm like, where's your buyer? They go, oh, they trust me intimately and they just pay me my commission. Yeah, so I'm like, what if insane. I could give you properties? You didn't have to go through this game. She's like, I'll take five right now. But and you it, look at those buyers, like one of our best buyers ever from, from a realtor, right? Always overpaid. But then I look deep dive on what the cash buyer is. Are you ready? it's a heart surgeon who's just got all this stupid money coming in making millions of dollars as a heart surgeon. Right. Yeah. Um, and he just gives a realtor. I'm like, here, here's 300 K. I want this as rental income for my retirement. Yeah. And it, it, he needs a ride. They're not asking me about my assignment. They're not, they just want yeah. They just want to make 10% cash on cash and they can easily do it. The uh, realtors making over 3% because they're overpaying and the heart surgeon guys, he's so happy because he's getting 20% discount. It's a win, win, win for everyone, but you don't find that unless you find the good agent like that. So it's, if you want to double your business this year, focus on selling your deals for more. And so many people, they work so hard getting a property under contract and then they just sell to the first cash buyer because, oh my God, I got rid of it. Uh, I mean, some of them you got to get rid of, some don't of get them. me wrong, but like, I got to be honest with you. Yeah. So as I progressed. I found out as a wholesaler, I was a liability on dispositions yeah. for my company. Why? I just wanted to move everything like sell it, sell it, sell it. And then I slowed down and then I actually, so, uh, we wound up getting a brokerage and then I would give it to my realtors to go find another realtor with cash buyers. And then they would talk and just like, honestly, we've had deals in the last three, really, especially in the last two or three years that we give it to the realtor and they give us 30 or 40 grand more than we could ever thought we could get. And so when I dispositions, in my opinion, is the easiest position to outsource in your company because it there's, 
listen, ex real estate agents, real estate agents, I want to work with you. You pay them anywhere from one to three percent, and you demand. You just got to teach them the time frame. Like I got two weeks to move this. That's it. If you don't sell it, I'm going to wholesale it to my other list. And then they get a fee on the success of the transaction. And nine times out of 10, they're going to get you more than you ever thought. So, so many of us think as realtors, oh, I got to pay them three or 5%. You're going to actually make six or 7% extra and they'll do a lot of the work for you. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, that's that's the live you did yesterday, Rick, on it. Do you want to just go break it down a little bit more? Because I think not many people know about this. Not, not a lot of people know about it's always been this standoff between wholesalers and, and realtors, but like what you're saying is you'll get at least 10, 15% more money for the deal. Um, and you're only going to pay 3% and you've got a realtor yeah. doing all the work who, who you can trust. One of the points you made, do you want to just uh, talk about not going around the back of them and that, you know, uh, so there's, <laughs> so one of the biggest challenges in wholesaling is as creative and entrepreneurs as we are, um, you always hear these stories about wholesalers going behind, you know, uh, your back and contacting the seller behind you. I will tell you, real estate agents do not understand how we acquire any of the properties and you explaining wholesaling to a real estate agent is usually pretty much a waste of time. Now on the disposition sides, realtors are wide open. Why? Because they get paid a commission and their clients want products. And a lot of times their clients make demands that's very hard for the realtor to fulfill. They're not wholesalers. They don't really, they're not a master at marketing direct to sellers other than getting retail listings. So knowing that and absolutely understanding that is from the disposition sides, realtors are much more receptive of working with people like me. Here's a little tip. Don't use the word wholesaler because realtors are taught a negative con connotation to it and they stay away from that. Most of them think wholesalers will waste your time. So I just, I talk to the realtor, maybe I find them at an auction, maybe I, so the easiest thing to do is find a realtor that has access to like realtor data. We call it MLS in the States. And then they can do incredible searches in there. They look for buyer's agents. That's when um, the buyer is represented by a real estate agent and they go find listing properties or off market properties. And then they get a fee for finding it. So. You can simply search um, buyer's agents for cash transactions, meaning there's no type of recorded mortgage. And you look in the last six to 12 months in the areas where you do wholesaling. So we would use zip codes in the state. Once you have the list, the really cool thing, Graham, is not only is their name, their email on it, their office phone number and their direct cell phone number. You just reach out to them. I don't force them into wholesaling. And I just simply say either on the phone or in person with them, listen, I have access to off market properties. I'm direct to the seller. And a lot of times these things need rehab or they need landlords. And then I'm going to vet them. What type of buyers do you have? Well, I have a buyer that loves to do rehabs in this area and he's demanding like three or four projects from me and I can't find anything. Once I hear that, I know they're going to pay me top dollar for it. Okay. Once I do that, understanding I don't go through the vetting process on it. Why? Real estate agents are smart on the buyers. They don't work with people that don't have money because they know they won't get paid. So you don't have to go through that song and dance. And nine times out of 10, they're looking at the deals for you. So the last thing I have to just train an agent on, hey, have you ever worked with a real estate investor or a title company doing an assignment of contract? More than half of them are going to say, I don't, I've heard of it, but I don't understand it. Instead of you trying to teach them how it works, I usually bring in a title company or you can bring in a lawyer and have them explain it from a third party authority showing you're legit. And at the end of it, they want to know it's legal. And number two, you know what the biggest question they have is? Do I get paid my commission? Yes. Most of my properties I'm looking to move in two to three weeks. We do an assignment of contract. You get the full rights. You get clear and uh, free title insurance. If your buyer is willing and ready to go, and once you establish that relationship, if they do one or two deals from you, you can sell, literally sell a deal for 10% plus or more to a real estate agent, close it in as little as seven to 14 days and get more money than you ever planned on. And you never even have to leave your desk and there's no contingencies on it. And I found this out with real estate agents. That's why I like to use them. 
Because a lot of, you know, the biggest craze has been, hey, use hedge fund buyers. I like hedge fund buyers, but they're slow. And they can get out of the contract at the last minute. Real estate agents, they're locked in, they're local. It does take time to build that relationship. But if you do it and you expand your buyers for your dispo for this, you will increase your profit for deal and you will become so much faster in selling your properties. And then you already have, now you have an avatar for what, your cash buyer agents want, and you can have more confidence going out and contracting those types of deals. Um, we constantly hunt particular types of properties for clients because we know they're going to pay top dollar. And that allows me to buy some properties at a little bit higher value because I know I can sell it instantly. So you got to use that strategy. Yep. And the list that you're talking about, Rick, is you... Get, you know, like if you've got a contact with a realtor or someone that's got a realtor's license, they can pull this list for you, can't they? So that, so you want them to pull that list and you have to understand is you have to honor the, the realtor code. They, they, they're never supposed to fight over listings and clients. Once it's their client, it's their client. So you might be tempted after you do one or two deals like, oh, well, you already have their buyer's information. You can go on public record. If you go around that agent, you're going to lose that buyer forever. And then they're going to spread the word in the, uh, the uh, realtor uh, community. And realtors hate when you circumvent it. You cannot risk it. It's not worth it. I never do it. And we've had a time where those clients have actually reached out and say, listen, can I just buy from you directly? I'm like, no. Say no, because you'll get more deals sold in the long run by taking um, that code of business ethic on it. So... Don't, do not cut the real estate agent after you do one or two deals. It's really bad business and it'll actually hurt you in the long run. Yeah, that's great advice. That, that live you did yesterday, Rick, that'll be done into a YouTube video on the channel, won't it? That'll be, you'll-, you'll Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. It's, that will come that up put that, put so. that in there because that, that was brilliant. That was, I mean, we all saw, oh, you know, buddy up with some realtors and that, but you really broke it down and made a lot of sense that oh, I never actually thought of that, like as deeply as that you, you said, you know, get the list. At, like you said, you don't have to skip trace it. The, the <laughs> yeah, you don't have to skip trace it. It's, listen, dispositions with realtors, it's, it's much, much easier. On the buy side, when I have to approach a realtor, hey, if you ever come across a property you can't sell, or it's like, they always look at you with glass. It's hard, it's hard. I, I, I get less than 2% that will cooperate. On the dispo side, 30 or 40% will all play ball with you because they want to sell a property and get a commission and they just want to make sure it's legal and you're going to pay them. And once they solve that, they're like, yeah, I'll do whatever. I'll put it together. And they're in complete control of their client. So your relationships with the cash buyer agent, it's never with the client and the realtors, they absorb all the drama, all the stuff, and you just keep it honest in business. And it's much, much easier. As I said, there's very little drama in those transactions. That's why yeah, I like it's, them. it's, 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 and it, that's an interesting point because we all think, oh, you'll go and work with realtors, but we think on the front end. But you're, what you're saying is it's too hard on the front end a lot of the times. I mean, once you've got a relationship with realtors on the back end and a bit of a network, you'll probably get pocket listings at the front end anyway. But with the disposition, they just take care of half the over half the dramas. They've got the people there. They know their buyers. They've built relationships. It's just... Mm -hmm. I never actually thought of it, and it's 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 a it's a ripper. So I, that's why I wanted to talk about it. Now, another thing you mentioned too, Rick, was auction buyers. Auction buyers will pay a lot more. They'll they'll buy sight unseen and just maybe get an inspection. And I actually know a lady that works at, at the auctions, and I was talking to her, and she said, "Oh yeah, look, I, yeah, I, you know, there's all these auction people." And I talked to them, and and she was getting into wholesaling. I said, "You've got a captured market there." I said, "Start asking the." And, and she rang me back and she goes, oh, yeah, I spoke to one lady and she does, uh, they do about, you know, 12 flips a year and another person does about 12 to 24 rentals. I said, you've got a cash buyers list right there and you've got a personal relationship because you work for the auction place. I said, that's amazing, you know. So auction, that that's probably another really good uh, private buyer is they pay top dollar, don't they? They pay top dollar. And like you said, They'll go there, there's 20 other people, and they miss out on the property and they're disappointed. Next thing, Rick turns around and says, well, I've got some properties off market that's cheaper yeah. than this. <laughs> so auction buyers are another good one. You mentioned hedge funds. Hedge funds have really slowed down the last couple of months because they've sort of taken a hit with the market. 
And I noticed that I've, I've um, you know, had some dealings with hedge funds and it's very unpredictable. It's very unpredictable. Sometimes they get back to you quickly. Sometimes they don't. Yeah, we want to buy it. They send an inspector out. Oh, no, there's all this stuff. And you say, well, mm -hmm. oh, and they might send an inspector who is in another state who absolutely <laughs> picks, picks everything out of it. And then the next one, someone might be all right. So there's so many variables there that you just can't control. So, yeah, and you have to constantly rebuild that relationship because people get hired and fired. And it's like, yeah. oh God, I got to do this all over again. So, whereas the auction buyers and the realtors is a more personal relationship, isn't it? Yeah. And, and once you set that relationship once, as long as you don't break it, it's there for. I've had relationships with buyers in that capacity for 15, 16 years. You build it once and it's done. So it's kind of nice because you don't have to service it. You just service it with deals. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, obviously for people that are new, another good thing is to hook up with people like yourself and, and people that do disposition, you know, do JV. And if you're really good yeah. at acquisitions to start off with, move the first couple of deals with someone that JVs, that's got this huge network that knows all these things, get a bit of money under your belt and then start, you know, maybe transitioning after half a dozen deals into building up your own cash buy list. So that's another a, a bit of a cheat sheet, isn't it? You know, line up with someone oh, yeah. that does JB that can move the properties. And a lot of times too, you know, like for instance, you guys will get a lot more uh, assignment fee than they would be able to get themselves. So it's not like you're taking money off them. You're actually probably earning them, you know, they might get seven grand themselves. You're earning them 10 grand and then, your money comes out of the fact that you're actually getting a lot more out of the buyer. So a lot of people don't think it's a bit of a false economy. They don't actually think of that, do they? No, yeah. they don't. It's crazy. Sometimes it's better to make 10 or 15 grand than zero yep. because sometimes people just don't have the skill set or they don't have the buyers. And if you can pair up, like we offer a JV program, but like, even if you JV someone in your market, as long as you keep it honest and upfront, taking half and getting, you know, a learning in your confidence, or it's not a bad move. I, I did a lot of that in the beginning when I started. I did not have a great cash buyers list and I had to learn over time. So if you have somebody who has to move a property quickly and you don't have the cash buyer network built out, find somebody you can work with even as a backup plan because I'd rather you take 10 grand than zero. Like you, you're never gonna get killed taking a profit. In the beginning, you have to make some sacrifices. So that's a great strategy. And, and that's for virtual markets too, isn't it? If you jump into a virtual market, you probably need to JV to move the deals until you get some presence in that market as well, isn't it? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. Um, the last thing, um, we've been on for a while, so I'll let you guys go. The last thing I wanted to ask you was another thing in a virtual market. I'll ask you for a couple of tips and tricks on this for people that have been in a market and they go, I'm going to go virtual into, into one or two virtual markets. What's the quickest way that you guys think to to actually be able to move deals when you haven't done a deal before, you haven't disposed a deal in a, in a virtual market, you've got the deal under contract and you go, what do I do with it now? I don't really know anyone in there. We've just mentioned JB. Uh, I would just do Facebook groups. I'd steal people's cash buyers pretty easy starting out. And that's uh, honestly what I do. I find a bunch of kids bragging about deals. I'll find the address of the deal. I'll find the actual owner of the deal who owned it and bought it, reach out to them, use them as a good cash buyer. Look at the deed, see where the title company from that deed's from, use that title company. Pretty easy. I like stealing people's cash buyers and it's very ethical because they're bragging about the deal. They show me the address. I see the cash buyer that bought it. I'm just going to reach out to them. Yeah. Let, let them do the prospecting for you. Cash buyers are not loyal to you. Yeah. And then if you lose your ego and you let them amplify their ego, that you'll cut out like 80% of the work. Okay. I've just got a question coming. Um, so <laughs> how, with the realtor system, Rick, how would that stack up jumping in a new market? It'd just take a little bit to reach out to some realtors, wouldn't it? Uh, but you could do that as well. Couldn't you? Uh, I'd not start out. What's that? Would you start out with realtors? Um, uh, no, because you, you've, you, the, the number one goal of doing a virtual market is make sure um, you prospect enough that you have deals. So if you start building relationships with agents right off the bat and say that's not a productive market, you're, you're going you're gonna to spin your wheels a little bit. So in the beginning, 
you're doing proof of concept. The, the advantage of virtual market, you can do it anywhere in the world, but you got to find. So just like a prospector is digging gold, he's going to do a bunch of test holes before he brings in the heavy machinery and makes a giant investment. You can't waste your time like building cash buyer agent relationships on a market you just started. I'm going to go through Facebook groups mostly first. I'm going to find um, any type of for rent ads, and then I'm going to try to go direct to um, the buyers so I can find out if these deals are profitable. Because as a virtual market, you're not as adept to the local market pricing, and you have to figure that out sooner than later because cash buying agents will eat you alive if you don't know the market. So for that reason, I don't want anyone to start out there. Yeah. Yeah. How about the, I've heard the theory of, um, people that do, you know, pre or is it foreclosure agents because they have auction buyers and they've got cash buyers. Is, is that the same thing that you're talking about or is that slightly different that you can, because they've got cash buyers because they have to buy cash at auctions at the foreclosures. Well, it's listen, a, a cash buying agent, they don't care where the deal comes from. Most real estate agents that represent cash buyers, they specialize in it, just like we specialize in working with distressed sellers. As long as you can give them clear title and it's legal and you can pay a commission, they don't care. So the smart ones work with auction houses and like, they, they, but they, the problem is what they hate is they have to go there and bid the properties up. And that's the challenge. So the problem is, if you drop in a virtual market and say you start collecting cash buyer agents and you don't have any inventory or anything, they're probably going to snuff you out and you're not going to get a good relationship with them. So I was just talking mostly from the dispo side because they're smart. They've already vetted their cash, but they're going to ask you questions like, what do you have under contract? What areas do you buy in? What's, what's the price range you're looking at? If you don't know the answers, they're just, if they don't like it, they're just going to take you off the list and tell you not to bother with them I anymore. Agree. Yeah. Okay. That's good advice. All right, guys. Well, I really appreciate your time. I mean, this has been huge. I, I don't know how long we've been on for, but I, I think it's been, what, about an hour and a half, two hours or something. So you've given us so many gold nuggets in there. Really appreciate it. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks, Graham. Nice seeing you all.